Hi, my name is Bryn Antrim and I'm one of the reference librarians here at Santa Monica College. Today we're doing a workshop called Level Up Google Researching and it is a tips and techniques workshop for using advanced search on Google. We're going to go through a basic search and what that entails, how to interpret your results, advanced searching options, Google Scholar and some caveats with that, Google Books, and some other tips and tricks. Um, this is being presented based on workshops by my colleagues Roxana Cruz and Cynthia Batista. This workshop will be available on the library homepage on our workshops links and also on our YouTube channel. Please do keep yourself on mute um, and I will stop the workshop throughout and keep an eye on chat and if there are questions. And as always, please be respectful, be engaged, and be kind to one another. So what is Google? Everyone now uses Google. It's used so much it's a verb, it's 25 years old. But oftentimes they think that Google is a repository, meaning it owns a bunch of websites or it owns access to things. It's not. It's a bot. It takes a look at your query, the words that you use, and it looks for those words in content and in meta text of the web pages that it searches. It does not search everything because not everything is openly available on the web. Um, I've seen various studies that guess between 40 and 50 percent of the information that is now digitized is not actually available in open access, which means you have to either be a member of some organization like um, you have to be a Santa Monica College student in order to log on to our databases and use them. That's all digitized information, but it's locked. Or you have to be an employee at Boeing in order to access their digitized web information. It's locked um, by that gate. The other way that information on the web is locked is um, actually a response to 9-11. After that national tragedy, it was discovered or rediscovered that a lot of national security and infrastructure data was freely available on the web in order to try to safeguard some of those or at least make them a little more difficult to find. Um, the U.S. government instituted uh, gateway uh, top sites and what I mean by that is um, they have to have the information available to the public. The Sunshine Act and other legislation has required that data from the government be uh, available to the public. So in order to try to have some control over it, they require that you go to the top page of that um, institution in order to search the holdings of that institution. So for example, if I wanted to find out um, about information from the U.S. military, on what is happening in Ukraine that is publicly available, I may not be able to just go to Google and find it. I may have to go to um, the Department of Defense and use the search field that's on the DOD top page in order to search their sites and their holdings. So that puts a little choke point in the information flow so that if a, a situation that is a threat to national security comes up again, that institution can go in and quickly block those sites without having to track all over the web and find them. Um, Google also has no evaluation process. Um, it just is a little robot retriever that goes out and finds words that match yours and brings them back. It doesn't contain um, or own its own websites. It is simply that retriever. And it offers generative AI content a couple of different ways, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So online platforms, Google, Instagram, Reddit, they use computer programming algorithms to determine what information to deliver to you. Um, and they learn with these algorithms to get closer and closer to what you're looking for. They call this personalization and it is used a great deal in marketing. But the other thing that this personalization does is it creates a bit of a bubble around you. Um, if we are always looking for one type or perspective, one type of information or perspective, then the information that we retrieve only includes those words, 
may include our own unconscious biases, will include the biases of the people who put that information up on the web. And eventually, we have our own voice echoing back to us, an echo chamber. Um, and that limits our exposure to viewpoints outside of our own and perspectives other than our own. And that can have real-world consequences, as well as making your research less sound. Um, you do research to find out many different aspects of a topic so that you can understand it well, and then you can write it with this understanding. If you only understand a small portion of the topic and you think it's the whole topic because that's all you've seen, then you're missing all of the other perspectives and concepts and context that you didn't get with your narrow search. So there are many ways to approach this problem, and I do recommend talking to your instructor and talking to a librarian um, for ways to find things like pro-con arguments, things like perspectives from people that you disagree with, which is very important to understanding the totality of a topic. So because of this problem that happens, um, be aware of the settings of any online service you use because that marketing includes tracking you, tracking your likes and your dislikes, even literally physically tracking where you're at by your phone. That's why when you walk into a department store, uh, an ad for something in that department store may pop up on your phone just, you know, a few minutes after you walk in the door. So be aware um, that oftentimes with these services, in order to use the service, you have to accept their terms of agreement and their terms of usage, sorry, um, means that if you don't agree, you don't participate in that platform. So you just have to be aware of how you use that tool because your information will be taken and sold, will be taken and tracked. Read your privacy statements. Um, the companies that you do business with, the companies that you use, share your information with other companies. They make money on it one way or another. Um, and part of getting out of your filter bubble is being aware of the fact that there are different opinions to your own. So always check your sources from multiple perspectives and check multiple sources. So for example, if there's a news story that comes along, look at it from different news sites, multiple sites. Um, use different search engines. Don't always simply default to Google or Bing. And maybe try a search engine that doesn't collect your data, like DuckDuckGo. And the last bit that I want to mention is biases. Um, bias is not always bad. We have positive, negative, and neutral bias. We're humans, and the way that we make sense of the word world is by putting our um, things that we see and experience into categories. Those categories contain, by their very creation, a bias for or against the information that you're putting in that category. If you are aware of your own bias, then you can balance it by the information that you search out. And you can fill those gaps in your own information from other people's perspectives. Um, not only do our personal views affect how we look for or make queries for information, but it also affects how we interpret information. We have a tendency psychologically to stop our search when we reach the first site that agrees with us. So my recommendation, my tip, is that you don't stop at the sites that you that agree with you, but you continue on to the sites you disagree with. Because those different opinions will help you interpret the information that you get more broadly and better understand your topic. So some things about a basic search in Google that might make them more effective. We've all been using them. That doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean we've been using them well. Um, keep your search simple. This computer does not see stop words like in, a, the, and, but. It sees unique words, and that's what it looks for. So you don't have to ask it a complete question. Um, you want to look at the words in your question that are unique or unusual, and you want to be specific. Um, and also, Think about relevance. Relevance, the way we usually think about it, is the number of times that your term shows up in the meta text and the content that you're searching. But it could also be 
deliberately inserted into MetaText for a site that has nothing to do with what you're searching for. So I might be looking for Harry Potter and I might end up getting um, travel information. That's because somewhere in that website, they in their meta, they put Harry Potter Castle. It has nothing to do with the literary criticism that I'm looking for and everything to do with selling a product. Um, or Google might be paid to rank or to place certain results when certain search terms are used. And that is not always obvious. So if I have a basic question, um, in what country are bats considered an omen of good luck? I don't have to ask that whole question. I can just say bats and good luck because those are the important words in that query. A couple of other examples. My three-year-old cow has blisters on its tongue. What's wrong with it? Panicked question. Well, you could use cow or cattle. You could use a synonym. Blister is important. Tongue is important. And sick is the synonym for wrong that you're looking for. So when you look at your search, when you create your search from your question, you want to think not just what are the unique words, but also what are some synonyms that might be better words to help the computer figure out what I'm looking for. So I heard there's an empty town in the San Francisco Bay. What is it called? San Francisco Bay and Ghost Town are the only things you need out of that question for the computer to find, for Google to find relevant information for you. So you want to reformat as you go, depending on the results that you get. This is called refining your search. So if my question is, I need recent credible information about floods in California, the two keywords are floods and California. So what are some search terms that I might look at? Floods or flooding or natural disaster or heavy rain or landslide. California is geography. So there aren't a lot of synonyms for that, but you can break it down into larger and smaller chunks. So you could say Northern and Southern California or Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, Los Angeles City, etc. Now, taking this um, to a current topic, if I'm looking at uh, floods and climate change, I want to find information that has a really broad coverage to start off with, take a look at my results, and then cut it down to be more specific. So I can use the term OR in caps, capitalized, so that the computer sees, oh, I have to pay attention to that. It's not a stop word. And I can combine synonyms or related terms to create phrases that the computer recognizes as a frame phrase. So I would enclose each concept in parentheses. So floods or flooding or landslides, climate change or global warming. And then I would combine these parenthetical phrases as if they were a search term. So floods or flooding or fl landslides is one search term. Climate change or global warming or sea level rise is another term. And what you're doing with all these parentheses and capitalized ORs, you don't have to make them bold, but they do have to be capitalized, is you are telling Google how to search. And the more you are able to tell the Google how to search, the better and more relevant your results will be. In order to help with this, we have something called Boolean searching. And is used when you want the term, when the term must appear in all of the results. So and, even though it sounds like it's making the term bigger, is actually the most narrow search because your term must be, all terms must be in all results. Or the one we just did an example of is really broad. Your term can apply anywhere in there. It could have global warming and not have anything to do with flooding and the computer will grab it. It could have climate change and have nothing to do with California and grab it. So everything that has any of your terms, it will present to you. Not is an unusual one. Um, in California, due to many factors, but drought and climate change are two of them, we've had a lot of wildfires. So I might want to do climate change, not fire, or climate change, not drought. And that will give me all of the articles on climate change or global warming, but none of them that are talking about the fire. And that is really good because if you have something that's been happening a lot or in the news a lot, like the fire seasons have for the last few years, that can overwhelm all of your other results. 
So, um, and, or, or not are specific terms that allow you to control how Google combines search terms. So here's what you get when you go searching. It, I am a member of something called Search Generative Experience, which is the AI beta test that Google is running right now. So you may or may not have this. If you're not an SGE, you won't see it, but if you are, you will. Then because of the way that I constructed my terms, it thinks, oh, this might be an academic search. So you could go to Google Scholar and look for scholarly articles. And here's where caveat comes in. Google Scholar is really good if they actually give you the article. Sometimes, often, publishers use Google Scholar as a marketplace and they will show you information about the article, like the abstract or how many times it's cited in the literature, but it won't actually allow you to access the article. They'll say you must pay for it. So if you hit a paywall when you're looking for an article on Google Scholar, Go back and see if you can find an equivalent one that you don't have to pay for in our databases. And you can ask a librarian to help you with that. And then it starts listing the websites that are applicable to this very specific and um, tightly constructed search. Okay. So when you have Google um, Search Generative Experience or SGE, it will ask you, do you want a Gen AI response to this and it will give you one and then it will allow you to ask follow-up questions. Um, this sort of response is also seen in Microsoft's Bing and in Google Bard. This is still in its infancy. Um, it may well be that this could be paid later and they say right off at the top info quality may vary but I believe that the future is a mix of generative AI contextualized response and AI-assisted searching that brings you back actual um, websites and, and documents. I think that's where we're going. So when you are looking at AI results, and this is with any generative AI, so it could be this, it could be perplexity.ai, it could be ChatGPT, whatever you might be looking for. Um, it is also essentially a retriever, but it's a little bit different in the way that it thinks. Unlike going out and retrieving specific pieces of information like Google does, it looks at a huge mass of unconstructed data, which means it's not looking at a journal article and then looking in the journal article. It's stripped everything apart and it has this huge bucket of data and it's going through it looking for patterns. And it looks for a pattern that is similar to your question and it returns that information to you with that pattern. Now I asked an example here, I asked for flooding and climate change. And what it gave me is how to prepare for a flood, which is not on target with what I'm actually asking. So I would ask a follow-up question at that point to give it more patterns to follow, to make it more specific to my request. And the more you iterate your question, the more you rephrase and ask follow-ups, the closer and closer it will get to matching your pattern. AI does not think, so it, its context is literally just matching patterns. So that's something to keep in mind. There are tools that you can use. For example, when you do your basic search, it'll have a tools icon you can click and it will ask you for, do you want this in a specific time period, the past week, the past month, the past year, or the past five years? So that's helpful, especially if you're working in technology or medicine or law or something where the um, landscape of information is changing very quickly. For images, you can head into an images search and there are many different ways that you could limit images, but I want to talk about usage rights. We live in a collaboratively constructed world, which means we are really, really used to just snagging something and reposting it, snagging something and sharing it. If you do that in your research, you are breaking copyright law most of the time because those images belong to the journalists, artists, and publishers who created that image. So one way to get around that and not get in trouble is under usage rights, you can choose Creative Commons licenses. And Creative Commons licenses, while they give you much less variety, are free for you to use without breaking copyright law. In addition, you can tell it 
I want to look for specific documents. I need to find a book. So you can look for videos, books, and other things. So here I chose to look for books. Um, so a caveat on the books. Google Books gives you prefaces. It does not give you the entire book. Sometimes we are tempted to take that snippet that it gives you and use that quote in our paper and pretend that we've actually read the book. Um, that will get you in trouble really quickly. So what I recommend is if you find a book on Google Books, then you go into the library databases um, and check and see if you can get hold of that book. And if you can't find it at SMC, check one of the public libraries because oftentimes if we don't have it, they will and vice versa. So I'm going to pause the recording for just a moment and we are going to do a little quiz. I don't see anything in the chat. Yes, it's true. Very good. So advanced search is both a strategy and an actual page. And the way you get to the page is if you head into the little gear, you can go into quick settings and it will allow you to go to advanced search. Now I want to men mention one thing about safe search. Safe search is very useful if you share a household with children. It is not useful when you are doing research. For example, if um, I'm a nursing student and I'm doing some research on breast cancer, if I have safe search on pages that I could use, even pages from the US government, um, from health sites, from hospital sites, will be blocked because it has the word breast in it. Well, I'm looking for cancer of that area, so I would need to know that information. So um, as an adult and as a researcher, I would recommend leaving safe search off. You will have to wade through some questionable and possibly disturbing content, but it also ensures that you get all of the pages you need to do your research. This is what the advanced search page looks like, and you can get there also directly at the URL that you see. It uses phrases, but the and is all these words, and remember that's the most narrow search, or is any of these words, it's the broadest search, and not is none of these words. So I might say this exact word or phrase, global warming, none of the words, wildfire, as an example. Some of the filters that come in handy, the language, the region, say I want to find stuff that's specific to the Western United States, when the page was last updated, particularly important for topics that things change a lot, and a site domain. Site domains are really useful because um, they limit the information that you give you, that it gives you, to coming only from a specific type of organization. So an educational institution, a nonprofit or not-for-profit organization, a U.S. governmental organization. One quick caveat, .edu is kindergarten through postgraduate school, so be aware of the content that you're accessing and evaluate it. You can also ask for specific file type or for specific usage rights as I showed you with images. Now I'll give you a sec to take a picture of this because I think this will be really helpful. One of the ways this is helpful is we do not have a particularly useful internal search engine at SMC. So if you're looking, for example, for financial aid at Santa Monica College, you could type in financial aid site colon smc.edu. And that will search for that term only at the Santa Monica College website. So that's one way to use Google as an external search engine. I use it for definitions a lot. I put things in quotations a lot so it doesn't look for synonyms or plurals. And I use it often to convert, um, particularly temperature and distance. I use it all the time to convert those things. Now we mentioned just briefly, but I want to dive in a little more deeply, that you have to check your facts. There is no fact checking going on. Google is a happy little retriever puppy going out and finding things with your words in it and throwing them at your feet and saying, there you go, have fun. So you have to look at credibility. 
Credibility is not the same as relevance. Relevance is just the number of times your term shows up. Credibility is how trustworthy is the information on that website. So it's a much deeper um, evaluative tool. Um, so your results are ranked in relevance, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're credible. You can um, be careful when you're creating your search query. Sometimes the words that we use have cultural connotations or context that can skew your results. Um, sometimes they have multiple meanings. And you have to make sure that you make the query, your question, your search clear enough that the computer knows which of those that you're looking for. If you don't, you get things like how to prepare for a flood when you're looking for the effects of climate change on, on flooding. And keep in mind that there are varying opinions on topics. Um, and the more you know about these opinions, the easier it is to communicate and have dialogue with them and better understand your topic. Always do your own fact checking. Um, if you find a piece of information in one place and you don't find it anywhere else, I would not trust it. Check multiple sources. Check the date of the information that you find. Don't just look at the About Us. In fact, they can lie. So I recommend going outside of your website to verify the information on that website. Um, and you can also, and I do, use fact checking sites. And fact checkers, professional fact checkers, use this lateral searching in order to make their determinations on whether websites are credible or not. In general, as you evaluate your sources, one way to do it, one of my favorite ways that I like, is called SIFT. We get into high gear when we're doing research. We're usually under date limitations, so the first thing you do is stop. Don't accept everything that comes to you as truth. Stop. Investigate where it comes from. Find outside sources. And trace claims. Oftentimes, quotes are used out of context and have a completely different meaning than what the person who originally wrote them intended. So if you use a quote, try to have it come from the original content so you can see that context. If it is quoted somewhere else, make that plain in your writing and see if you can track it back to the original quote so you can see the original book chapter or journal article or speech, etc. that it came from. Here are some of those fact-checking sites that I mentioned. I'll give you a second to take a note on those. Make me take a picture. My two favorites are PolitiFact and Snopes. They've been at it long enough that um, it's really hard to fool them. It's not impossible because it's humans and humans can fail, um, just like computers can. But they have a long history of being um, truth sniffers, and I like that. So were we in person, um, I would ask people to go ahead and try this out and see how it works. Uh, as we are not in person, I know it's very difficult to navigate from your phone to a Google search and back to the Zoom session on the phone. So I just wanted to show you some of the queries that have come up. Um, the first sample research question, some of the pitfalls you could find. What is ChatGPT? Could lead you to a whole bunch of coding. How is it used? narrows that down to a specific focus. How does media and advertising impact body image? Media or advertising would be your first term in parentheses. Body image would either be in quotation or in parentheses as a phrase. And that would help it focus specifically on what you're looking for. And social media activism, change, and society would be your search terms here. And I would do an and between each one because I want the overlap of those things. If you would be so kind, I would like to see how well my teaching has gone today and how much you learned from this. So if you could take a picture of this form and go to it later, that would be wonderful. Um, it walks you through um, our student learning outcomes for this specific workshop. Um, and helps you review some of the things that we covered. And as I go over the results, it is anonymous, anonymized. Um, I would be able to see where I failed and where I succeeded in teaching you what I wanted to teach you today. 
Now you may be taking this for extra credit and if in that case you might have a teacher who requires you to have a code word and the code word for today to show that you came is cloudburst. If you need any help as you go, be aware that there is Ask a Librarian Assistance on the library homepage at any time. Um, this is also embedded in many of our databases. And also be aware that Google is one stop on your research. Um, your research should also include databases and should include books, articles, news, and journal articles um, to get the broadest understanding that you can find of your topic because we don't do research so we can write a paper. I know that's counterintuitive. You wouldn't be doing it if you didn't have this paper due, but we do the research so we can understand the topic. And once we understand the topic, then we can write a paper that shows that understanding. I wish you the best with your research. If you have any questions or need any assistance, please do contact us. I'm going to show you quickly how to get to the library homepage from the school homepage. You would mouse over student support or if you're on your phone, it'll drop down menu. Click on library. Once at the library, you can ask a librarian at any time. Please be aware this little guy is an AI for SMC information. This is an in-person question where you're talking to a college or university librarian. If it's at a time when SMC is open, you'll talk to one of us. If it's a time when we're closed, you'll talk to a college or university librarian from one of the institutions that's in our consortium. And if they cannot answer your question, they will send us a ticket. And as soon as we are open again, we will email you and get back to you to answer that question. So good luck with your research. Bye.